introduce the speaker this morning. Her name is uh, Pat Tavares, which I'm sure that a lot of you probably already know. So, uh, go ahead. I had to say that she developed a lot of you in, that are in this room today. So, Pat earned her BSN from St. Anselm's College of Manchester, um, and she got an MS in Parent-Child Health Nursing and an MPH. Um, in Health Policy Administration from Boston University. Um, her career spans many decades over various leadership and educational uh, practices. She's directed nursing services at Winthrop Hospital, Oklahoma Children's Medical Center, the VNA of North Shore, and Winchester Home Care as the Executive Director for Nursing and Allied Health. Um, as a clinical specialist at Oklahoma's Children's, she successfully developed the program to transfer long-term ventilator children into the community and into public school systems. Additionally, she implemented and she worked for 12 years in a small adolescent medicine practice, educating teens and their families about disease prevention and health promotion. So she has definitely a tie into what GLFHC does. She's board certified as a nurse executive and a nurse educator. She's recently retired from her position as the assistant dean at Northern Essex Community College um, in the Division of Health Professions. And during her 10 years at Northern Essex, she spearheaded the curriculum revi revision for nursing that enables career ladder progression for the practical and associate degree nurses. She's participated in the Massachusetts Coalition for Nursing and is now faculty liaison for planning of the new public health community health worker certificate, which that we'll look forward to because I'm sure we'll employ some of our graduates for that. Um, and, and also an associate degree in science for public health. So, Welcome, Pat. You know, it's great to be back here. I was here in 2011, um, shortly after the Institute of Medicine's talk in terms of nursing and the preparation for nursing. So I'm not going to talk about those recommendations again, but what I hope we can talk about today is nursing and uh, the opportunities that exist, also some of the work done by the Massachusetts Coalition for Nursing, because I think that's the bright spot. You know, in 2011, we talked about what healthcare reform might do, what the Institute of Medicine was talking about, what we should do, and I think we've finally gotten some traction on that in terms of what it'll afford us for nursing. Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the AARP has certainly put some money behind this, so I think we have opportunity. It's probably a great time to be. A lot more choices for us. So let's look a little bit about these. I'm just going to flip through these very carefully. <laughs> Um, can you all see this? It's, you know, it's too bad we didn't put it in the back. Let me tell you about this. This just talks about the fact there are 3 million nurses in the United States. I mean, we are a healthy, large group of providers of care. And frankly, the whole idea behind the IOM and some of the issues in the recommendation is that healthcare can be transformed through us. Don't let anybody kid you. It really is through us. I'm not saying that we don't have providers and collaboration, but we do a lot of that hands-on every day. So we really can make a difference, and the Institute of Medicine thinks we will. But this is how we're broken up. So the average age by discipline, um, the LPNs were like 46. The RNs, as of 50, our average age is about 50. So that's telling us that we need to re regenerate and look at what we're doing. The nurse practitioners are about 48. The physicians are at 49. Nursing faculty is 55, and I want to tell you it's actually probably closer to 58. And so that's where there's a problem in the terms of the faculty and nursing faculty retiring. And MD faculty is about 49. So we have some work to do in terms of what's going to happen with the whole baby boomer and issues like that. Now, in terms of gender and race, this is an important thing. We haven't changed much in the last four or five years since I was here in terms of the number of uh, males. Males may be up a little bit um, from the 2004, but I didn't get any new statistics. But what it says is that we still have an underrepresentation in terms of diversity as far as males are concerned. The other thing, term also, too, is nurses in terms of diversity as far as where we come from and the representation we have, particularly in this community, in terms of how we want to represent and be part of our patient population. We still need to do some more work because, in terms of the Hispanic Latino, we're at 3.6, uh, and the black African is like 5.2. What that tells you then is that we're predominantly a white female population in terms of nursing. We need to change that. It's that opportunity to make us closer to the patients and the folks we serve. But in order to do that, we have work to do in terms of helping folks get there. From a population comparison, if you look at uh, what the white population is versus the white nurses, you can see it. Uh, 
the population is about 65 percent. It may actually be a little less than that uh, because I think we've had some changes in the proportion between the Latinos and the blacks. But either way, we still have a high white population compared to the rest of the patients we serve. In terms of the Latinos, uh, they represent about 15 percent of the population, and we have only 3.6 nurses. So we really want to encourage that. I think that's what the future of nursing is about. Can we encourage that diversity and also that uh, change in terms to represent our patients better? The healthcare challenges, well, you know those probably much better than I do. The chronic <laughs> conditions, I wouldn't have to tell you any of these without. You know those from the patients you serve, correct? They are what we see. Uh, aging population also requires a lot more healthcare services. There's no doubt about that. And the health disparities is the other thing that happens. We understand that with racial uh, and poverty, what do we see? We see a lot more uh, racial, we see a lot more disparities in terms of illness, their ability to successfully uh, have care and the provision of care in terms of insurance, et cetera. And so that makes their behaviors and what they are actually driven to care for themselves about very different. Another thing about all of this chronic challenge for us is the, the English proficiency in terms of what our patients understand and what they can do. Is that true? It certainly yes. is. Um, primary concerns in the health reform, we saw that. It was an issue in uh, thinking about changing health care and how we pay for it or how folks were insured. Service. Certainly what we were trying to do in this country was to get at least um, 32 more million people insured. And that was really to do better around quality, access, and value. One of the things I want to focus on, and I didn't the last time, is this. We're ranked 37th as far as developing countries in terms of mortality and morbidity. But we spend extraordinarily greater amounts of money than most other countries do. So that says something about us. Why is that? And if we could, in fact, look at how we spend our money, could we be ranked better in terms of mortality and morbidity? That's a challenge. And if the ION is, is really correct about what nursing can do, we might be able to affect this. And if we weren't spending so many dollars in some ways, we could spend dollars in others. Would you all agree? And it certainly could affect what we do in terms of that. So that if we could lower, for example, if we're paying about 8000 a year per person in terms of medical care in this country, and other countries are paying 2000 to 4000 and they have better mortality and morbidity, there's loads of questions in terms of what we could do. I think the opportunities in our future is right for what we can do. It has to do with us and prevention, promotion, things that you do every day in so many ways. Isn't that correct? This is where it's happening. I mean, it's not in the acute care hospitals that um, is the pivotal piece anymore. It's where people live. It's the communities. It's that ability you have to meet with them. And so I think that's a really important piece. Uh, the principles or the challenges for change in the United States. Prevention, patient-centered primary care. What's, what is it for you here that you're working on when we think about prevention or primary care? What are you working on? What's that model here? Yes, the PCH. So everybody knows what the PCH is, the medical home issue, right? So that's a really important piece. So here's the future now. The future of the nursing campaign for action. Each one of you has one of these. Okay, now this brochure here talks more about the issues about the uh, uh, Bachelor of Science. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but one of the issues under the Mass Action Coalition was really to look at how we could educate the nurse force to continue. Because one of the things that they found in studies in the literature is that as we advance in education as nurses, we do do things to reduce mortality and morbidity. There is studies now, they can demonstrate that. The University of Pennsylvania has found that. So what I included in here for you, all of you, is um, the issues that are about the Mass, Ac the Mass Action Coalition. This is actually 13 focus groups that worked with 140 of us in the state of Massachusetts to talk about how we could do academic progression, how we could look at practice. And one of the other things that was really important to nursing and the Institute of Medicine was that in the state of Massachusetts, the advanced practice nurses are probably the ones who have the narrowest scope of practice of um, 38 states in the union. So there are 12 states like us. There are 38 or states that the advanced practice nurses can practice to the full extent to which they've been educated. So that's a really important piece for us in terms of moving the practice in Massachusetts so that the APNs can practice to the fullest degree possible. Those are important things. And there's been some work done. Um, the Mass Practice Association folks are looking at that, so the Board of Registration and Nursing will work with the Board of Medicine to change that. 
If you go into New Hampshire, any APNs in the room right now, nurse practitioners? Um, if you go into the state of New Hampshire right now as a nurse practitioner, your ability to function is so much different in terms of patients and your ability to impact care. So that says something to us about the future of nursing. Really important. So one of the ideas for this Mass Coalition, and the Mass Coalition got Robert Wood Johnson grants to support this, was to look at academic progression, and it was to look at the scope of practice, particularly for all of us. The APNs were highlighted, but it was really about what did the registered nurse do? What can she do? And what can she do more fully than what she does now? What can the LPN do? So that's part of what nursing is all about. So we're really looking at that. Uh, when Massachusetts got their grant from the Robert Wood Johnson, they got it as a model. There were nine states that were awarded grants, um, and we got a renewal in 14, 14, 2014 and 2016. And again, it's to move things along so that we can make a difference. The other thing we did um, is look at, in the Institute of Medicine, there was a concern that, in fact, we didn't have enough data. We didn't know how many nurses we needed. We didn't know where nurses were. We didn't know when somebody was going to retire. We never had enough data about nursing as a group throughout this country. Nor did we have a sense about what the population needs were going to be. So one of the things that's also happening in this mass coalition through it, well, at least in uh, Massachusetts, is we're looking to figure out who are we and what do we have. In that, you know, in that brochure, it talks about the fact that Massachusetts right now has 143,000 nurses. So this second paragraph here, really is to talk about a little bit about that workforce about nursing right now. Um, the RN workforce through 2012 is expected to grow to 2.71 million, from 2.71 million to 3.24 million. So that's an increase of about a half a million nurses, about 19%. However, replacements for RNs who should in fact retire, of which I've said Okay, uh, should be another half a million. So what that's talking about is by 2022, we have an issue of about another additional million nurses. So if you think about that million based on the fact that we're three million right now, that's huge, don't you think? That's a quarter to replace. That's a lot. And the problem with that in and of itself isn't that we couldn't do it because we might have enough availability to do it, right? The problem is, in 2012-2003, nursing schools turned away 79,000 qualified applicants. And so we know more about what we're doing, and we know more about what our problems are. And that's the good news, because you all know if we don't have the right problem, right, we don't solve it, correct? You can have a lot of problems, but if you haven't got it identified, you know. Faculty shortages were the main reason. So like you, and Ed shared this with me, which is pretty exciting as far as I'm concerned, you have your nursing mission, vision, and your philosophy, right? On the table here. Well, the other thing that Ed shared with me, I want to share with you. This is the vision and the mission and the goals for the Action Coalition in Massachusetts. We really want to be a national model for nurses advocating and partnering so that we can reshape patient care. We want to always use um, the Institute of Medicine as our mission. And we want to disseminate the Institute of Medicine report. We want to build consensus around academic progression, educating nurses. Those are really important. Um, how many of you have, have a sense about the Nurse of the Future competencies? Okay, some of you do. All right, the Nurse of the Future competencies was to identify, in fact, what it was that everybody needed as the mainstay for how you practice. And that was another thing that we have nursing schools, we have hospitals. We have community centers, we have VNAs. We all have ideas about what we think practice is, but what is entry into practice and what is good practice? So one of the other things that the Mass Coalition did was develop competencies that they wanted to share, core competencies. So if Betsy and I were working, we would understand these core competencies together, that regardless of where we went, those things would be important to us in, in patient care. So that's the other thing the Coalition wants to do. It wants to standardize in some respect what a nurse does in varying places, but it also wants to be able to make sure that everybody understands it. So to disseminate that becomes really important. We want to increase uh, the number of nurses from the BSN to the PhD. And here's some of the achievements that have happened. In two, from 2010 to 2013, we have increased the number of baccalaureate prepared nurses 34%. Of this group, 81% were people returning to school. Now there's some of you here that were associate degree that went back to school, right? 
How many did you finish? Yeah. Very good. Congratulations. Oh, going. You're going. <laughs> That's the important part. You just want to keep going because, in fact, that'll help us in this issue here. Um, the let me see the other thing. Um, Mac also did something that was really important. Mac wanted to know from all the employers in the state of Massachusetts what was important to them about preparation for nurses. And so we sent out 64 hospitals. We interviewed 64 hospitals. We then worked with VNAs, long-term care facilities, and community <laughs> health, because we wanted to know, does the employer believe in tuition reimbursement? Does the employer believe in education? What could we do to help it? Because it was one thing for us to be nurses who believed in this, but what did the employees believe was important to them? So the survey came out, and the survey does concur that they believe what we believe. So now it's a point, again, about finding ways to do that for all of you, so that, in fact, that there is availability money from the federal government, from hospitals, and other employers, so that you can do this work. Because without flexible scheduling or money, can you go? No. 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 So we need to do more work around that. You're absolutely correct. So that's really important to us. Um, the last piece that certainly we, re we recognized was the nursing faculty challenge. Some of it has to do with age. Some of it has to do with, in fact, finding enough positions to hire faculty into full-time positions. And some of it has to do with this. Faculty salaries, interestingly enough, are probably the lowest in occupations for nurses. Uh, would that surprise you? No, it shouldn't. Well, if it does, I'm telling you something new. Um, faculty <laughs> salary, <laughs> at least in the public sector, which I represent for the last 10 years, so that when we have nurses that are educated beyond the baccalaureate, when you're trying to hire faculty, you compete. Because if you're a nurse practitioner who's gone on and would like to be an educator, we can't compete because salaries are an issue that are remarkable. So that's another challenge for us, is to find ways to augment that so that we compete so faculty compete in various ways, like with other employees. It's a really important piece. And so academic progression in the community really is the last piece I want to tell you about that I think that we finally did some work that was extraordinarily was how many know what it's like to argue between an associate and a baccalaureate and your credits? What's the biggest issue? Sometimes somebody doesn't want to accept your credit, right? They want you to do something over again. And the last thing you want to hear is that somebody wants you to take a credit again, right? How many of you heard that? Ooh, it's awful, right? Okay. So one of the things the coalition did was decided to talk to all the public colleges and associate degree colleges so that we could agree. And that's a really important thing when you think about agreeing. It's called negotiation and compromise. Um, that we would do a nurse education transfer compact. It's a fancy four words for saying that if you came to Northern Essex or North Shore or Mass Bay, Mass Bay, Mass Bay, that the sister schools, or the brothers, I don't care whatever it is, like UMass Lowell, no seriously, right? UMass Lowell, Salem State, Fitchburg, Framingham, they would make it less problematic for you. They would make it easier so that you could go from one to the other. Because one of the detriments right now to education is it's not easy enough, right? So we worked on what we call the NETC. The NETC was approved in December. So our hope now is that we will all be in a much better place. So that in fact, when you finish one, you can go to the other. Now that doesn't mean you don't have a GPA issue or something, but it means that we're going to accept those things in a much more efficient, effective way. Because if we keep putting up roadblocks, we can't make it happen, right? Roadblocks need to be decreased so that, in fact, you can do it. Northern Essex, for example, when we were having issues around uh, articulation and agreement, some of the things we did was we worked outside of our sister schools, meaning that the publics. I mean, St. Joseph's really worked with us very hard because they wanted our students. They were all online, so we did that. Uh, Revere was also accommodating. Uh, SNHU, there was a lot of work around the private schools being more willing to look at us. So I think our work with the public schools now balances what we've been doing so that, in fact, we can make it easier. One of the things in the future for us, very quickly, in this community is um, we're working with Regis. They want a partner. And in a partner, that'll be a little different because they'll come to us. And if the partnership goes, they'll come on, on the Lawrence campus. And they'll start teaching on the Lawrence campus. And they will take a lot of your credits. We've already done some of that work. Now, officially, I can't tell you the program is here. 
because and uh, their accreditation hasn't been approved. So you didn't hear that officially. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> we believe that the nursing accreditation will come through for Regis and they can have a second site. But they're also going to work on the credit per hour. So those are the things I think. Now I'm not telling you Regis is the be all on you but I'm telling you it's got good foundation for negotiation about money, to be local so you don't have to go places, okay? But we've also done those things, I think, with you most low and some other places. So there's opportunity for you. I think the thing is just the drive you've all had to go, but we've made some changes. Now, in 2018, you know, if you want to ask me back, in 2018, I'll tell you again, I'm kidding. <laughs> But I'll tell you again, but this is the thing, these are the things that are going to continue happening. For the first time, I think we see money. For the first time, I think we talk about things that mean we really believe in what we believe. Don't leave the room here, though, thinking I'm saying to you that we shouldn't have all the layers of nursing we do. That's not what I'm saying. We have a place. We need LPNs. We need associate degree nurses. We need us to all get started. Because everybody has needs in their lives that are important. Start where you can start. Put your feet on the ground and get going. Because nursing is a great place. And you know what I wish for all of you? If you have 50% as much fun as I've had, you are in for a wonderful road. Because it's been great. And the other thing is, there are so many more ways you can be nurses. I'm amazed. You know, I, I, I scanned the job applications, and I go into those, you know, like monster.board and things like that. In a brief time over six months, in the last couple of years, there were five more new titles for registered nurses. What does that say to you? That says that there is a willingness to look at what we can do. And so it's really just having that hopeful opportunity for all of you. And on that note, happy Nurses Day. So I, I vote for Regis too, because that's by all the mana, and I'm working on my doctorate. So I'm happy that they're coming here. It might make opportunities for me as well. So, um, I want to bring up Dr. Kelly. She's going to um, say a couple words uh, for the, from the physician side. And I just want to say that I've only been here for five months now, but I've really enjoyed the five months. And part of it is because the collaboration with the physicians has been phenomenal. I mean, honestly, they're very welcoming. And Dr. Kelly has been a great partner with me. So I look forward to many years of that relationship. Dr. Kelly. Happy Nurses Day, guys. I have to say it's just wonderful to look out and see so many faces that have, you know, been working with our patients for many years and a lot of brand new people as well. It's just great to see everybody together as a team today and I wish you a very happy Nurses Day. Um, I just want to let you know how much you're appreciated. I, I don't think it's, we can't say it enough, you know, how much you're appreciated and how much the patients appreciate all the work that you do every day. I know that the, um, the work can be very challenging. I'm sure you can think of moments, probably every day, that have been uh, challenging in your work, and there are definitely times that are uh, stressful. Um, but I'm sure you can also think of moments that were just beautiful, where you know you can just feel the connection with the patients and colleagues, and know that you're really making a difference in people's lives. And if you can think of those moments, there are many, many more moments that you may not realize how much of an impact you're having on people every day. Um, and that's really important to remember, is that as, as caregivers, it's, it's not always um, easy to, to see how much of an impact you're having on other people. But when you're caring for them, it makes such a difference in their lives. And it's, it's such an important um, job. And I think that just being nurses, you impact and influence other people, because you're caregivers, you know, people see what you're doing and the schooling that you've been through and all of the progress that we make and it has a huge impact on other people. I think that's wonderful. So you're very appreciated. Thank you so much for your work and let's continue to work together and uh, serve our patients um, and work in our teams. I think it's going to be a great future we have ahead of us. Thank you so much for your work. Happy